how how just you will access things and more logisticals. And the first that I need to make sure I clarify and explain, we are using a different method in the organization this time. I'm using Google Classroom instead of Moodle, which is what we've used before. And I think actually you might find this a little bit um, simpler, I hope. I find it a little simpler to use than Moodle. So I'm just going to show this to you. If you did not already get access to this code, I can send you the link later. It came in an email, but uh, I can give you the link in the chat as well. I just want you to see as you're looking down, yours will not look exactly like this because I'm, I'm seeing a different view. But you will just see as you go through, you'll see you know the first lecture, the second lecture, and so forth going through. And each one of these, you're going to have some kind of homework, either pre-lecture or post-lecture. So if you sign up here, only piece of advice I would give you, pay attention to this tab. The stream tab I find almost completely not useful. Uh, pay attention to this tab, go straight to classwork, and then it'll be, I think, really clear. And each one of these, I'll just give you like a reading and um, you know some feedback. You can write a short paragraph and that kind of thing. If you have any problems, let me know. There were a few questions because I've used Moodle for so long. And so uh, a few of you are wondering what's going on or how's this different? And I just want you to know that's what's going on with that. Um, and then let me show you one other thing before I get started, which is that I want you to just know the teachers that we have coming up. So I'll show that to you. You, you actually could have seen this already in your own um, if you just went through the website there's a link that took you here with some of this but I'll show it to you here so that you know what to expect with upcoming teachers so we have a really good set of teachers uh, coming up next time Brent Nidergal uh, he's a pastor in Canada and um, so he has done a lot of work particularly with the text and textual criticism um, I have very much been challenged. The kind of work that he does is above my pay grade. Uh, I read some of the stuff that he puts up and it, he's getting into some really complex <laughs> stuff. So he will talk us through some of that. Uh, Romans is not a super complex book on the text, but we do have a passage at the end, Romans 16, that is a bit more complex. And so he'll talk us through some of that and I know others as well. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Dr. Olinger will just join us. That'll just be for one hour, um, but he will take the first hour and he will be talking to us particularly about uh, sexual ethics as expressed or as you see the contrast to in Romans 1. Michael Riley will talk about apologetics and the heart of man related to Romans 1. Dr. Collins, you're familiar with if you've taken other classes. Uh, he's here, really the place to put him would be later in the semester because he'll be getting into Romans 9 through 11. However, uh, his wife is gonna have a baby. So there's some uh, logistics with that. It doesn't work for him to do it any other time. So he's gonna come a little bit early and really I'm okay with that in the net of everything because just Israel and the Gentile question is all through Romans. So it's good for us to get it early. It's just the way the logistics worked out and it's good. It's good for us to get it early so that we're already thinking that way. Dr. Christopher Indeen, uh, he is a teacher in Arizona and also a dean, the dean of the department, I think the school of religion there. Um, and so he'll take us through Romans three and four. Andrew Minnick will take us back through some topics we've hit, resurrection and the son of God. And then I've got one other in here that's not reflected in this schedule. Um, I'm still needing to work out some of the details, but Lord willing, Glenn Kerr, who works with Bibles International to talk with us about some of the complexities that happen with Romans and translation, which I'm very intrigued by uh, some of the difficulties that happen with that. And the Dr. Oberlin talking to us about conscience in Romans 16 or Romans 14, excuse me. John Sheik talking to us about Romans 16, the uh, he will crush, God will crush the serpent under your feet. Um, and so he's going to take us into some intertextuality questions. And he suggested to me, and I very much agree, for whatever reason, that little comment in Romans 16 does not get a lot of attention. So he'll take us more in that direction. You'll see throughout that I'm kind of doing the the flyover exegesis, um, meaning I'm just I'm trying to cover the chapters individually. So <laughs> unfortunately, you're stuck listening to me a, a decent amount in this course. Um, 
the thing about that, as far as that goes, is that I will do my best to try to cover as much as I can with uh, just the general overview across Romans, those general chapters like that. But this will not be a full exegesis course in the sense that, no, I'm no way are we going to be able to go through like verse by verse and cover all of the details throughout. So mainly what I'm going to do throughout is try to show you some of the core issues, some patterns, some things to pay attention to. I, Lord willing, will also try to give you a, a study guide, which is entirely optional, but you could use it for your own purposes in terms of ministry or however you wanted to use it, just to give you kind of another resource that you could go to. So that's some of the overall logistics of the class, the way the class will be set up. And some of those questions. Um, if you have questions, interrupt me here and drop it into the chat, and I'm happy to talk about those. Otherwise, I will jump really straight into our initial topics because there are a lot of things I want to talk about here. So if you have a question, please just interrupt me and we'll go with it. Um, with that as an introduction, then, uh, let's talk about just one or two things for study of Romans or where you would get started with working with it. And, hmm, where did I put it? Aha. No. Um, well, in any case, uh, I'll mention three commentaries to you here. I don't know where I put that commentary I was looking at. Um, three commentaries to you here. One of them that I would want you to be familiar with, and it's really the commentary I want you to if you're gonna purchase one commentary. Um, it would be on from in the Baker exegetical set and it's by Tom Schreiner. Uh, if I'm looking at it here, <laughs> this is terrible. On Kindle, it's $60 as a Kindle edition. And I, if it was me, I would not buy something, a commentary on Kindle, unless it was really, really cheap. Um, but here it is, and it's very, very good. It's excellent really, really good commentary. The alternative to that, the one I could do, this is actually not it, but it's the same cover. Uh, this is this would be Mu, uh, just would look like this. So I'll just cover up, this is Luke. I'll just cover up Luke and then we'll pretend it's Romans. But it looks like this. Um, and it's Mu on Romans, and it's kind of the other standard major commentary that you can do. Um, the other though is a two volume and it's expensive. Uh, and this is another that is, um, well, anyway, it's a, it's kind of a core volume. It's a slightly critical. Uh, it's not one that I would use as my, um, my main source on Romans. Um, but anyway, you can pick it up and it's a very common one to go to. And I'm just trying to pull it up here so I can show you. Okay. Um, so this is in the International Critical Commentary set, and it's Cranfield. Ah, no, they don't give me a they don't give me a uh, cover for it anyway. So let's try it here. Uh, okay, and if I'm looking here, I'm finding it paperback, sixty-two dollars for one volume. Um, you're going to do a lot better if you pick it up on one of the software versions. So I pick it up on I picked it up on Logos. Uh, Cranfield, and this is going to get you into really more of the technical details. Uh, he goes into a lot of depth with just genitive uses and Greek grammar kind of details. So if I was going to stack these up, uh, Cranfield would be the most detailed and the most rigorous, the most academic. Uh, the second, Mu, which was the one that looked like this, um, and this is in the New, Interna New International Commentary on the New Testament. And that's still fairly detailed, uh, but and it's going to give you solid coverage. But the reason I like Schreiner in the Baker set is that he does such a good job of tracing the argument. And that's really, I, I appreciated that. I don't get lost in the weeds. I don't get lost in all of the details of genitive uses, but I really benefit the most, I think, from just tracking the argument. So anyway, that would be my recommendation. If you're going to make a purchase for this course, if you don't own Schreiner in the Baker set, uh, I really you should you should probably buy it. If you don't own one of those three commentaries at all, um, then start with Schreiner, and then from there, if you're still looking, still wanting to expand out and do others, then then you could continue consider Cranfield, or you could consider Moo. All right, um, 
I gave you a, just a reading assignment to cover the theology of Romans. And I also, I will do a lot in this lecture. Here's another just great resource for some of the questions that we'll talk about tonight. Um, yeah, okay, thank you for that good, good comment there. Cranfield is $40 on Logos. Um, Moo and Schreiner, both into second editions, yes. So, good. Um, and, well, I'll make a comment and then come back here. Uh, this is another good resource for the introduction, New Testament introduction. <laughs> it's a terrible image, sorry. Um, so maybe you can see it a little better. But this is uh, Carson and Moo, and they just give you the, like, the different details, date, provenance, what we can know about just the general overall purpose, some of the interpretational questions that come up. And a lot of my lecture tonight will be drawn from there. If you are interested in going further into this, uh, I worked through Carson and Moo, and then I worked through Schreiner, same thing, the introduction. And Schreiner just takes, he basically takes the same positions. He just t covers it in more depth. So you're a short flyover, like maybe 20 pages of introduction to Romans in Carson and Moo will get you started, and then Schreiner would take you into more detail with them. Um, interesting comment here, and I'll, I'll comment this because this will kind of take us into what we're going to talk about here. Um, so one of you commented in the chat that Moo and Schreiner are both into their second editions. Um, the interesting thing about Romans and Roman studies is, you know, you would... You could be tempted to think, okay, so surely everything that needs to be said has been said. And you would definitely be on the wrong track. We'll just say that. Because actually Romans and Roman studies is kind of hot right now, um, or has been, because there's, there are significant issues that are still getting raised on these questions. So that's where I want to start here tonight. We will talk about this a bit more later on. The question of having to keep up with the latest perspective on Romans, and particularly, if you're familiar with this particular issue, uh, the new perspective, a uh, new perspective on Paul, and attempts to kind of reconfigure Romans. Um, there are reasons that I don't go that direction, but I want to talk about that some in this class, though I don't plan to go too far in it. So, yes, actually, there is a lot of reason that a uh, commentators like Moo and Schreiner would move to a second edition because it's moving <laughs> and there's discussion that's happening and there are questions that have to be answered and even interpretation that's getting deepened uh, even within just our lifetimes, the last decade or the last two decades. So let me start with an introduction and it's a quote um, or not a quote, but yeah, well, it is. It's, it's his own writing. Here's Martin Luther reflecting on Romans. In spite of the ardor of my heart, I was hindered by the unique word in the first chapter of Romans, the righteousness of God is revealed in it. He, he doesn't give the antecedent here, but the righteousness of God was revealed in the gospel. I hated the word or the expression, the righteousness of God, because in accordance with the usage and custom of the doctors, I had been taught to understand it philosophically as meaning, as they put it, the formal or active righteousness according to which God is righteous and punishes sinners and the unjust. As a monk, I had led an irreproachable life. Nevertheless, I felt that I was still, I'm interpreting, a sinner before God. My conscience was restless. I could not depend on God being propitiated by my satisfactions. Not only did I not love, I actually hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. Thus a furious battle raged within my perplexed conscience. These words righteous and righteousness of God struck my conscience as flashes of lightning, frightening me each time I heard them. If God is righteous, he punishes. But by the grace of God, as I once meditated upon these words in the tower, the righteous shall live by faith and the righteousness of God, there suddenly came into my mind the thought that if we as righteous are to live by faith, and if the righteousness of faith is to be for salvation to everyone who believes, then critical foundation of the Reformation. It is not our merit, but the mercy of God. Thus my soul was refresh, refreshed, for it was the righteousness of God by which we are justified and saved through Christ. These words became more pleasant to me. Through this word, the Holy Spirit enlightened me in the tower. Um, very intriguing personal testimony, because what you're getting here is, what do you say? I mean, this is deeply personal theology, this is a deeply personal struggle. It's deeply practical. 
And what it hinges on is exegesis. <laughs> so it's his exegesis of Romans, his understanding whether he reads righteousness of God one way or reads it another way that is making all the difference in his salvation, his understanding of the gospel. And historically, you realize, of course, off of that, a, a, a correct reading of the righteousness of God and understanding it in context a correct reading of that that gives birth to an entire historical movement, the Reformation, that is significant enough if you pull up any textbook on world history, the break with the Catholic Church, Protestantism, is, a, is just at least a massive catalyst around some historical forces that were already happening, but move us in some directions that we're continuing to play out you know, basically, well, more than 500 years later. So you've got some things here. I mean, we're doing exegesis of Romans, but your understanding of the book like this has massive consequences, at least in this one person's life, and even then now in world history, because Martin Luther would trace this back, his reading and his interpretation, his understanding of the Psalms, Galatians, and Romans as kind of the turning point for him. Okay, so <laughs> this is a big deal, essentially. Um, and one other comment I'll make in here, which is, this is related to the new perspective on Paul question. One of the really interesting things, though, is that evangelical or maybe in some cases post-evangelical interpreters and theologians today would look back at this turning point for Martin Luther and say that he went off. Or at least, let's say that his, his reading of Romans was a bit of a caricature. He missed it. And they're going to argue that post-Reformation reading of Romans really kind of misses the big deal. <laughs> so now we've got post-evangelical or evangelical, and in this case now, a fair number of evangelical by name um, theologians and interpreters that would go back on that critical turning point <laughs> in exegesis. And, and therefore now we're, we really have to make sure that we actually understood it correctly. I don't want to go too much in that direction because it'll take us down a rabbit trail, but basically they're going to say Luther was focused on the question of righteousness, personal, individual righteousness, and instead of thinking of it as individual, we should be thinking of it as corporate. The concern of Romans is not so much how can I, me, you, him, her get saved. That would be evangelical language uh, and you know 20th century language. Um, but post-Reformation anyway. And instead, we should be talking about corporate Israel, the corporate Gentiles, and how you stay within the covenant and things like that. We'll talk about some of that later. So are they right? Did Luther get this wrong? Do we need to roll back our reading of Romans to a pre-Luther understanding? Or are we on the right track here, reading it as I would, that Romans is probing the questions of how an individual, and yes, sure, corporate, but an individual can be righteous before God. Are we reading this correctly or not? Well, that's what we're hoping to answer and explore in this class. Let me then ask you a question that's going to set up for my next discussion, or the next thing I wanna talk about. And the question is, I, I want you to think canonically, think across, all of scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. Anyway, if you want to start with Old Testament, then we can move to New Testament in a bit. But if you were going to orient Romans canonically in the whole picture of the New Testament, the other 65 books, or excuse me, the whole Bible, the other 65 books, what would you think would be the top, at the most five, we'll say, at, at the most five, the top books that are connected or related or similar to Romans? Um, and just... I'll take a moment here. I'll pause for a second. Give me some input in the chat. Pick out at least two or three and at most five of the books that occur to you as deeply connected to Romans, related in terms of, I don't know, themes, um, or really, I would say any kind of connection that comes to your mind. <laughs> what are some of the, the cousin books? Uh, if I was doing this with other books, I don't know, you know, if you mention Luke, you've got to mention Acts, right? If you're going to mention the Gospel of John, you've got to mention the epistles. Um, they're so tightly woven together. If you're going to mention Ephesians, you've got to mention Colossians, that kind of thing. Uh, so what are, some of the, what are some of the cousin books 
that are closely related to Romans. Take a second and we'll just get some things in the chat here. Okay. Um, this is good. There's good input here. And, and I think two of you answered Psalms. Uh, I see Genesis. Um, probably the contenders for the most often, I see Isaiah, Habakkuk. Uh, okay, good. On gifts, Corinthians, because you've got this significant overlap between like Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 12. Um, so great. Okay, definitely some really strong contentions in there. Probably the highest or the ones I'm seeing repeated the most here are Galatians and Ephesians. Um, I am sympathetic to the point with Galatians or excuse me, with Ephesians, I don't know that Ephesians is the first one that would occur to me. Um, I think maybe, maybe possibly the reason that's coming up here is, I mean, it's true, I can see this, um, that if you're thinking of just something that's so magisterial, so profound, so massive in its implications, something like that, uh, I can see those kinds of ideas. Both of the books are just huge in term, conceptually and almost hard to wrap your head around. Um, I'll pause here because this is as good a time as any to talk about it or to say it, but it occurs to me to say with Romans, <laughs> this is kind of blunt and maybe uh, embarrassing, um, but I, I would say previous to working on the book for this class, I have always felt intimidated by Romans to an extent that I would, I would go so far as to say I didn't even really enjoy Romans as much as I enjoyed other books. Um, you know, if I was going to mention my favorite books, Ecclesiastes, I love, um, Revelation, I love, Matthew, some of that's just as I've worked on them more. Um, but I've always found Romans just difficult to wrap my head around. And working through, following the argument, just chasing the argument through kind of, I don't know, spins your head enough that I, I wouldn't say that I've, I wouldn't say that I've just... It's not like that's the book I, Romans is the book I go to um, that just stirs my heart. Uh, there's times, there's, you know, Romans 3, end of Romans 3, absolutely beautiful, 8, 10. I mean, there are passages that I love. But, uh, okay, honest, Romans 9 to 11 doesn't tend to stir our hearts. Um, and the, the, the intricacy of the argument, okay. So I think that's a good common point for Ephesians, uh, but I, I don't know if that Ephesians would be one that immediately comes to my mind. Um, I really like some of the, some of you put down Old Testament examples, like Genesis, okay? You might not think of Genesis, but if you go to, Gen to Romans 4 and you jump a little bit later in, um, and you'll find Romans 4, Romans 9, Actually, there's a significant part of Romans where the argument hinges almost entirely on narrative issues from Genesis. So, I mean, at least a good two chapters or something where he's doing a ton of intertextuality stuff with Genesis. I think two people commented Psalms. That's another one you would not think of, but you guys are on to it, uh, which is the intertextuality between Psalms and Romans is massive. And we'll look, we'll spend a good amount of time on intertextuality. So anyway, yes. And then Habakkuk, there's of course the famous quote uh, that we're thinking of, the just shall live by faith. Isaiah is another one of the big intertextuality passages. Um, however, what I'm going to do for just sake of time or reality and what we're limited to do, I'm going to go into Romans and Galatians. And those of you that put Galatians, if I was going to only pick one book to be the close cousin to Romans, it's definitely Galatians. Um, these, the two books are related in the same way that say like Ephesians and Colossians are related, just really tightly connected. And one or two comments before I go into some of the details of how that works. Um, I would just like to observe my argument with these two books would be that Galatians is like the short version of Romans. Galatians precedes Romans in terms of when it was written. But I read Galatians as like the concise version of Romans, almost as though he took the argument of, of Galatians, later he expanded it out, and we got Romans. <laughs> I mean, that maybe is overstating it, but not entirely. Uh, both books have a very similar trajectory. And what I mean by that is both books follow a similar flow of thought. Let me show this to you this way. 
um, here, I just have it in four steps. Defining the gospel, if you think of Romans 1 and Galatians 1 through like the middle of 2. Salvation is by faith. Romans 4 matching up with Galatians 3. The gospel brings freedom in place of the condemnation of the law. Uh, so that last part of Galatians 3, 4, and up into 5. And then the freedom of the gospel is the freedom to obey God. The argument of Galatians, right? That it's not freedom for sin or the argument of Romans in 6 and later Romans 8. Well, 7, 6 through, through 8, really. That uh, we have the freedom now to serve, to obey righteousness. <laughs> so it's a freedom to be obedient. I think those four points are really parallel between the books. If you think about what I just said, though, um, essentially, for the most part, you're kind of doing like Romans 1 through 8, following or tracking most of Galatians. The last part of Galatians 5 and 6, where you get into the practical, you're going to maybe see that matched up. I was reading earlier today and saw some echoes going on in like 12 and following. So, okay, you can do some things like that. But I would say those four themes are the things that really capture my mind or capture my attention. And if I focus in on Galatians a little bit, uh, Galatians starts out with this contrast between the true gospel, Paul's gospel, and the other gospel. Pay attention in Romans, and you're going to have a lot of gospel language in the early chapter, or the early part of the book, like chapter one, uh, followed by Paul's apologetic for his gospel. And then uh, worth paying a special attention to Galatians 2, 16 to 21 is like a core section. This is the, a man is not justified by works of the law. Oh, I can share it. But by faith of Jesus Christ. And so even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I mean, if you listen to that language, it sounds like it could be lifted out of Romans. Um, and I'll jump just time here, but I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Um, this sounds very Romans-ish. And I would say this little core, Galatians 2, 16 to 21, could be roughly echoed like at the end of Romans 3, where I have another similar theological core. So I could do some parallels like that. If I jump to Romans and I'm looking for some of the same progress of thought, okay, remember Galatians had the gospel, the true gospel, as opposed to the false gospel. Well, that's Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God. Um, the logic of Romans 1 and 2, that both Jew and Gentile stand condemned, come out to what would be the parallel-ish core, uh, kind of a conceptual core, that happens in Romans 3.21. So just like Galatians 2, I have a parallel core here in Romans. The righteousness of God apart from the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ to all. All are justified freely by his grace when they have faith in him through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, his righteousness that he might be righteous and the justifier, the righteousifier of the person who believes in Jesus. So I think, the, again, those two passages are close enough that there are some strong parallels there. Uh, let me show you what I thought was Anyway, it helps me to try to organize it this way. If I was going to compare two themes or sets of themes in Galatians and Romans, uh, this represents Romans. And, well, actually, I'll jump. Let's look at Galatians first. Let's start with this. Uh, Galatians contrasting another gospel versus the true gospel. I kind of take chapter one as a nice organizational principle. Uh, the other gospel, a false gospel, not good news at all. And that false gospel is characterized where it's taught by false teachers, reliant on the law, resulting then in personal effort, works, effort accomplished by the flesh. Of course, the flesh, really complex term, and we'll hit some of that later. But in Galatians particularly, I think my reading of it would be uh, more of an emphasis on personal effort, strength, right? like your own arm, your own power. You did, I did it. I did this myself resulting in slavery and bondage. The true gospel, the contrast here, instead of false teachers, Paul, the true apostolic authority, uh, law and circumcision contrasted with the Abrahamic covenant, 
works and faith, that sounds very Romans-ish. Flesh and spirit, very much Romans. But slavery and bondage with liberty, down here, these are similar. Um, though down here, you're going to get the bondage to the flesh and bondage to the spirit is the way that Romans, I think, is going to frame this. Okay, so this is how I would do the contrast with Galatians. If I was going to do the contrast with Romans, I would frame it up like this. Um, it's sim super similar, but it's there's differences. <laughs> okay. Salvation by works versus salvation by faith. It says it's the same thing, but I'm using Romans language instead of other gospel, the true gospel. Condemnation versus righteousness. I don't, I don't know that that particular framing of it or that pair comes out in Galatians like that. But it's huge in Romans, isn't it? Works of the law versus faith. Flesh versus spirit. Uh, sorry to give you whiplash, but just if you jump back across, I mean, I have the flesh, the spirit over here, but I've got some parallel there, but I, I've got differences too. Slavery and bondage versus liberty. I, I think these ended up, though they're, they're parallel over here. Okay, slavery, bondage, liberty. Slavery and the bondage versus liberty is also framed up. Do you remember in um, Romans 6, you are free from the law, but you are slaves to righteousness. Okay, that's just an interesting or a different twist on it that I don't think I see in Galatians. And then Jewish promises versus Gentile salvation. Uh, one other point of contrast that I view as a major one between the two books, and I, this is a thought I'm still exploring, so I don't know, maybe, I'll, maybe I need to be corrected here. But I feel like Galatians is going to take you more in the direction, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. If, if you think an issue we'll talk about in both Romans and Galatians, how does Jew, do Jew and Gentile relate to each other? And the whole problem of Romans 9 to 11, big deal. How do we Gentiles relate to Jews? And how do we relate Old Testament, New Testament? How do those fit together? Massive question. Okay. I think one of the things going on between Romans and Galatians, Galatians approaches that question from a more salvation historical direction, I think. Anyway, <laughs> you correct me. I'd like to learn. But I, I'm, I'm convincing myself of this thesis. It's going to go more a salvation historical direction, as in the focus, think like Galatians 4, uh, and our old faith, or our, not our, well, our, not our old faith, but the, the way pre-Christ versus the way after Christ. The law was our schoolmaster, and then we come to a richer understanding of our relationship to the law. And it's not that we were ever saved by law in the Old Testament, but there's more of a focus on the time orientation moving across. And I think Romans focuses more on the people orientation. In other words, it's the groups. It's the Jew versus Gentile. Those are so interwoven that I don't think you can unstring them. In other words, salvation history time is always interwoven with Jew and Gentile and the groups. So, okay, you can't extract them. But since they're connected so tightly, I think Galatians tends to speak of the same question or the same problem using more of the time question and Romans focusing more on the groups question. And they're asking the same question and giving the same answers, but I think maybe framing it in two different ways. So anyway, that's just a thought. Um, you can see what you think with that. Uh, good comment here. The link of Romans to Ephesians is the discussion of the reconciliation of Jews and Gentiles in chapter two. Good, it's good. All right, I think I'm gonna stop there. Um, well, except for maybe one more here, and it's a set of questions I'll just show you really quickly here. Um, but here we go. Uh, after, the, after this, I think I'll move on from Galatians and Romans. But here are questions that I think both books are answering or asking in respect to this Jew and Gentile question. Sorry, it's so small right here. Um, are God's promises to Israel canceled? Does that mean ours might be also? Is God that kind of God? How can the law just be set aside? Can God cancel previous words? Are Gentiles better than Jews or are Jews more important to God than Gentiles? Those questions are coming up in Romans 9 to 11 and of course also in Galatians. All right, I think that's it that I will do on the topic of Romans and Galatians. If you have um, further input, happy to, happy to talk about that further. Otherwise, I'm going to move to Romans and intertextuality. And uh, I think this is super interesting, partly because we did a lot of work with intertextuality uh, last year. 
and I, partly just because it's um, it, well, it's very significant. This this was a major point of learning for me. I just did not realize that this dynamic was going on. So what I did is I, I relied on Logos a lot here, uh, and I'll show this some of this to you in a bit, but their intertextuality browser is excellent, really, really good. Um, sometimes I feel like the, uh, the, the price of Logos, I, I'm going to I'm going to go for it just for the sake of some of these tools like this. It's really good stuff. And actually, you don't have to get that deep into Logos to get some of these tools. Um, so I find myself going to Logos for the sake of this. Uh, if I do a comparison with Romans and I want to know how much intertextuality is there in Romans versus the other New Testament books, I just pulled out of their resource. I am only going for citations and what do they call it? Uh, citations and quotations. They have two other categories, echoes and allusions. Echoes and allusions are just if they're, it's kind of like the language is there, but it's not super clear. Okay. But a citation or a quotation is either it says, as it is written, or as Isaiah said, or, you know, uh, I think that's in Romans, Isaiah is very bold and says, you know, that kind of thing. That would be a citation. And then a quotation is where you have an extended a phrase, an extended set of words, three or four words at least, that are almost verbatim. I mean, you can trace them back to like the Septuagint or the Masoretic text. Okay, so in other words, these are the really strong cases, not just stuff that uh, sometimes I look at the Logos module and I'm like, uh, I don't know, you know, I mean, I'm glad they put it in there, um, but they'll just toss everything in there under echoes. Uh, but these are strong cases. If I do that for every New Testament book, I end up with this graph. Um, okay, let me comment first so I'm clarifying. This is not raw numbers. This is per 1,000 words. So as a percentage or as a, right, as how often it is if you balance out the size of the book. In other words, like here, obviously, First Peter is a short book. James is a short book. It's not like it has more instances than Matthew does, but as a percentage, how often it's happening. All right, so anyway, here's what really kind of blew me away. <laughs> I think of intertextuality and my mind goes to Matthew. And in terms of raw numbers, yes. Um, but actually the biggest, if you average it out by number of words, is Romans. Romans has as a percentage, like how often it happens, Romans has the highest intertextuality. Right up there with it is Hebrews. And from there, you, then you, you, know, you work your way down. In some of these cases, statistically speaking, First Peter is a smaller-ish book. I mean, it's still got a lot of intertextuality. But, you know, as you get into the lower levels, maybe those numbers aren't super representative because it, it kind of skews. There aren't that many words in the book, really. Romans and Hebrews are massive. What's going on with that? Here's the table where I just pulled that in. Um, and some of this even is interesting. Uh, citations, 67 citations in Romans, seven quotations. So anyway, Paul is, when, when, he's, when he's doing it, he's also giving you this it is written kind of format or Isaiah says. And I, I do think that actually is a piece of relevant information here too, um, because I think by doing that, what he's doing each time is intertextuality. I'm quoting the Old Testament, guys. You know, I mean, because you can go to, let's say, Revelation here. Revelation only has two quotations, and even those are disputed. And so you can say, like, Revelation has almost no intertextuality. Well, drop in the echoes or the allusions, and Revelation goes through the roof. Revelation doesn't have the it is written format. It's just melded into the whole fabric of the text, and you don't even notice it. But the way Romans has done it, it's even like more than Matthew. Up here, Matthew will do 14 quotations, 37 citations. It's like anytime Paul's going to quote the Old Testament, he puts in, it is written. And he just does that over and over again. Why? And I think that's very intriguing to make the argument that I'm going to make in a bit, which is that Paul is on purpose making a really big deal out of intertextuality, specifically because he wants to argue, he's going to intentionally argue here, that his gospel is compatible 
and a natural, proper extension of the Old Testament. So one of Paul's contentions here is kind of think the apologetic role that you saw in, that you see in Galatians. Part of his contention here is I did not come up with my own gospel here, but this is in fact absolutely authentically from the authority of God and it's also connected to the Old Testament. And I am legitimately drawing this from the Old Testament so that he just fills it with Old Testament content, calls your attention to it by every time he cites it on purpose saying, it is written, it is written, it is written, doing it that way on purpose in order to make his point that his gospel is truly connected and compatible to the Old Testament gospel. All right, in order to um, substantiate that further, let me show you one other way that just helps me appreciate it I think on a higher level, or just stuck out to me as I started working on it. So I'm going to put up here a handful of verses. I chose out, um, or I should say passages. I chose out, let me count, one, two, three, four, five passages that I thought particularly really demonstrated the depth or the thickness of intertextuality in the book. I'm going to show it to you in the CSB. And the reason I chose the CSB, it's kind of interesting. Um, if you've not worked with the CSB at all, give it a chance. Uh, this was the Holman Christian Standard Version, and now I think it's called the, what is it? I guess that's Christian Standard Bible. Um, so they're kind of, they're, they're competing. They kind of want to, uh, they will kind of want to maybe surplant, sur, uh, supplant the ESV. But one thing I like about them is that they bold every time, they put text in bold every time they have a quote. And it's interesting. It changes the way you read it. Uh, when I go back to other translations that don't do it, I miss it. So anyway, I think CSB kind of makes you more conscious of intertextuality. And it's just a formatting thing. It's really simple. It's just formatting. But because of that bold text, you pay attention to it better. And here I am pulling in, I think, what did I just say? Five passages that are thick with intertextuality. One of them here is Romans 3. And here it's just... I mean, it's like a diatribe of Old Testament quotations, just one after the other. Okay, so anyway, we come to this passage and we just read through it. But you've, I'm sure you've seen this and, and recognize it, know it. But anyway, it's helpful for us to help our people see this too. These are Old Testament quotations. So he's drawing mostly from Psalms and Isaiah. And he's just, uh, there's one quote in here that I care about. It, that, I mean, that I especially care, I care about all of them. That I care about especially because it's Ecclesiastes. It's the only case that we can make of pretty good intertextuality, like pretty clear intertextuality from Ecclesiastes. But that really matters to me because I especially love Ecclesiastes. It's helpful for canonicity when we're talking about that. Um, anyway, there is a quote here from Ecclesiastes. But there, you've got it. Okay, uh, chapter four, it, I only included one verse here. If I, if I expanded this out, then you would see the whole chapter works this way. But I'll just comment here that, that intertextuality, Abraham believed God and it was credited him, to him for righteousness. There at the bottom down here, um, the bottom of the, the screen. That quote becomes the basis of the rest of chapter four. I mean, so the intertextuality to Genesis drawing from Genesis 15 and the whole Abraham story and later on in the Abraham story. But that intertextuality to Genesis controls Romans 4. Like Romans 4 is all resting on intertextuality. Uh, go to chapter 9, as it says in Hosea, I will call not my people my people. And then, but Isaiah, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. And here's another quote, just as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord had of hosts had not left us offspring, um, and if you keep on going here, I'm just wanting to show you just, just so you kind of appreciate how much, I mean, it's like every other sentence or something. It, it, he's strung the quotes in here so thickly that you just can't miss it. And again, pay attention to my point earlier. These are not just quotations, but they're citations. When he'll say things like this, you know, the righteousness that comes from faith, faith speaks like this is a way of saying, here comes a quote. On the contrary, what does it, I mean, that has to be scripture. What does it say? And he gives you another quote. For the scripture says, 
everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And so he, he here it is, as it is written, Isaiah says, in other words, I mean, he even wants you to go, whoa, there are a ton of Old Testament quotations in here. <laughs> Um, and if you miss the, 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 how, how many there are, the, the richness and the thickness of the quotations, then you've missed something about the argument. I'm still in chapter 10. Again, I mean, just notice how thick this is with Old Testament quotations. Um, and I'm going now to chapter 11, just the amount of bold that we get here. I'll end out here with this last string. Sorry, it's split across the screen, but uh, chapter 15 at the bottom so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy as it is written. And then you have three quotations strung together. Each of them, again, you have it as Isaiah says, or it says, and again, that, those introductions. And his argument is resting on intertextuality. So anyway, point, I hope, sufficiently demonstrated. Romans is thick with intertextuality. And in a, I, I, just, I would just say in a strikingly thick way. Um, let me talk for a second about what intertextuality, as in, yeah, what books is he drawing from? And this is where, where the answers you guys gave were earlier were just right on. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, you, you guys were you guys are seeing some of this already. Um, but again, I'm drawing from the Logos intertextuality diagram. Uh, I think this is very helpful. And so here's here I, I chose out the Pauline books. If you're going across the Pauline books and you limit it down to citations or quotations, right now I'm just on citations, uh, I just want you to see, I mean, you've got Romans, this bar across is a relative, so do you, let me explain what you've got here. This bar across is just showing you Romans on the left side of the screen. And on the right side of the screen where it, it moves over to here, these are the Old Testament books. Okay, so when I highlight Romans, it's showing you every Old Testament book as it's represented in Romans. Okay, so how much in Genesis, while well, the bars going across to Genesis are fairly thick, how much in Psalms, the yellow going across is pretty thick, Isaiah and so forth. And if I just look across and compare, I mean, there's 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is not, I mean, it's it's almost as long as Romans. They're, they're, I forget the difference, but it's like in the hundreds of words. Okay, so I mean, 1 Corinthians and Romans very parallel in length, but look at the difference in how much intertextuality I have. From there, I'm gonna to go to 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and that's it for citations. Let's try quotations. If I do that, I get more, and this balances out a little bit more. You can see, I mean, there's relatively less on Romans, and I go across and I have other books, Pauline books that have a, a decent amount of intertextuality. But anyway, I think point made either way with citation or quotation, Romans is thick. I'll go back here. Let's just pay attention to which books uh, the books that you guys said. <laughs> so, so my pick would be Psalms, Isaiah, and after that, Genesis. Genesis, not as many specific passages as Psalms and Isaiah, but the thing for Genesis is that basically the entire argument of Romans 4 and most of the argument of Romans 9 is built around Genesis narrative. So even if it doesn't give a quotation, I mean, you've got two chapters out of the book that basically rest on Genesis. <laughs> Abraham, later Pharaoh, and um, Jacob and Esau in chapter 9. So Genesis is massive. Uh, Deuteronomy is there too, but anyway, not like Psalms and Isaiah are going to be. Okay, um, so again, give us a sense of where Romans is drawing to. Let me break those down by specific books. I took some time and went through each one of them and just, I read through all the passages in uh, those books, the intertextuality passages. And if I was trying to summarize them, I would break it down like this. Genesis is basically linked to the Abraham story, but also the later on Jacob and Esau and Pharaoh, uh, which I guess, I mean, we're now in Exodus for that, in that case. Uh, Deuteronomy, the biggest cluster is probably around the word is near you in your mouth you have the revelation god has already revealed himself that kind of idea that comes up in deuteronomy um especially towards the end psalms the biggest cluster is the the depravity cluster in romans 3 you know there's none righteous no not one a bunch of those are psalms and then genesis or excuse me romans 15 with that, the gen Gentile salvation section, a decent number of those come out of Psalms. Isaiah, the biggest cluster there is the hope for Israel, 
that you get in chapter 9, again in chapter 10, again in chapter 11, also uh, Gentile salvation. If I'm breaking it down in Isaiah, Isaiah 52 and 59 are a bunch of the passages, um, or just a larger proportion of the passages that are, that are occurring there. Okay, so that's that. But one more point to make before I leave intertextuality is that I want you to appreciate why why I think this is such a big deal or why this is critical to the argument of Romans. And I would invite you to notice here at the very beginning of the book, um, actually I did other references and I don't remember where I put them, but at the very beginning of the book, I, I just invite you to recognize here, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Um, I remember one off the top of my head, and it's chapter 16. If you get to the end of the book, you're going to get the same thing. Um, this here, the according, uh, well, him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise be glory forever and ever. In both passages, what did you get? I mean, central to his argument is that my gospel, he's saying, matches the Old Testament prophecies. My gospel is not anything new. My gospel follows, continues, and extends the core that you would have read, read about if you were a careful student of the Old Testament. And I don't think I ever appreciated that about Romans <laughs> um, until working on this, but it, it's a theme. It's there. It's a big, it's actually a, a big deal. And uh, paying attention to the intertextuality and how much of it happens, I think highlights it. So that would be my candidate for the parallel to the Galatians concept. The Galatians concept, you remember, this is not another gospel. Um, the false gospel. It's not another gospel. My gospel is the true gospel, Galatians 1. How do you know it's the true gospel? Well, look, I didn't get it from anybody else. I got it from God. God gave it to me. And so this is the true apostolic legitimate gospel. Okay, that's the argument of Galatians. I think my candidate for that in Romans would be the parallel argument that's happening here in Romans 1 and Romans 16. The argument that Paul, right at the beginning when he starts out, uh, this is the gospel that was promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And here, I'm setting that gospel before you. This gospel is not contrary to the Old Testament. It completely conforms to it. All right, that takes us right to 859, so we should take a break. So can, I, can we get back in at, let's say, 905? And um, where we'll go with the remainder of our time today is I'm going to give some go more in the direction of the background for Romans. So like NTI, I want to talk with you about the NTI of Romans and then get into a thematic theological overview, though I, anyway, I can't do that much of, of to, that much with it and conclude out with the structure of Romans. And our basic idea here as we, much as we can to try to get our overview so that we have the book in front of our eyes and uh, set a foundation for moving forward with it. All right. Thanks. So see you back in five minutes. So what I said we would work on here, I will continue with that now. And so our next section, we, we spent a good bit of time on intertextuality. Uh, I would invite you, if you're interested, uh, take the time, look through, and, and read the passages. You can do this easily with the Logos, um, the Logos module. If you want it, I can send it to you. If you don't have access to Logos, uh, I can send you the list of references, the Old Testament passage that matches the New Testament passage. And I, I found that a very beneficial, profitable study. So anyway, consider it. Uh, that may be something that would be helpful. But let me talk about the basic background for Romans. And so what I'm moving now is to NTI. Uh, as I said earlier, that's mainly drawn from this. When we say NTI, I'm sorry, I shouldn't use nerdy speak. Um, but NTI, we mean New Testament introduction. 
And when you hear a New Testament introduction, your first thought is, okay, so like the basic overview or something. Well, actually, New Testament introduction has come to mean an apologetics type of class uh, where what we, we spend a lot of time talking about when the book was written, who is, it was written to, the purpose of its writing, uh, so author, source, date, and some of the situation that's surrounding it. So that's what this book is really all about. It will go book by book and we'll talk through uh, those kinds of introductory information, pieces of information for each book. So I wanna talk about that now. Um, and a couple of comments here. Romans is Paul's, Romans is the longest epistle from Paul. Um, you would think maybe I would have thought, oh, no, what about, what about 1 Corinthians? They're close, but Romans is longer. Uh, that's probably why it's in the order it is in our canon, the way that, you know, the traditional canon that we have. Um, another unique or interesting detail of Romans is that it's not often tied to specifics of the setting. What I mean by that is occasional. It's not in terribly, a terribly occasional book. When we say occasional, occasional is an English word without context, you know, well, from time to time. Um, but we use occasional in biblical studies to say it, it was an, an occasion or it was this, this was the situation that was called for. And so Paul wrote this book to address a need. And therefore, highly occasional books, books that were connected to an occasion like that, are going to be like 1 Corinthians is massive, right? I mean, because it's just constant. He's dealing with this issue and that issue and the other issue. Uh, Colossians is occasional. Even Galatians is quite occasional because he's going after here to this audience. There's this need. I need to address this, right? So that makes those books kind of unique in that way. Romans is different because it, it really doesn't get into a lot of, uh, you know, so someone wrote me and I need to address that issue. It's kind of universal in the sense that just one commentator just commented, you could almost read from 116 all the way until chapter 13, maybe up into parts of chapter 15, and almost apply that to any church. I mean, you could almost, every New Testament book we know applies to every church, but you could almost just drop that in and be like, okay, this was written to Colossae and, and not really lose a lot. Um, anyway, his point is not 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 to build too much there but there's not a lot of discussion in there about this specific issue that needs to be addressed uh one other comment before i move into a few other details is to say sometimes commentators will get into what is the genre and so you know is it diatribe or sometimes there there's there's no end of different genre labels that people will try to identify. And what's going on here is we've we've discovered a lot of the papyri, we've discovered a lot of ancient letters. Um, if you're interested in it, it's really fun and just interesting. You can find online, and I can give it to you, a very massive work with um, almost an endless number of ancient letters. And they're fascinating to read. It, it'll give you the Greek, and on the other side, it gives you the English translation. And uh, they kind of sound like our emails or something. I mean, there's you see little cultural stuff leak through. Um, I found one, sorry, this is such a bad rabbit trail, but I found one that was uh, amazing to me here just for being really, really sad. And I shared this with one of my other classes, um, but it's here. Uh, it's a, it's a, a man writing a letter to his wife, presumably. She's apparently pregnant. And uh, he just comments in here, um, I remain at Alexandria and take care of the little child. As soon as I receive wages, I'll send it to you. So that sounds like a typical letter. I'll, I'm going to send you money as soon as I get paid. Um, if you're delivered, if it's a male child, let it live. If it's a female, cast it out. And then he just keeps on going and gives his date. And I mean, that's, it's astonishing. Um, and this is, this is just correspondence that was sent from one man to uh, his wife. Or, um, yeah, to his wife. So anyway, there's an endless number of these kinds of letters. Well, biblical studies, people have tried to go through these letters and categorize them and recognize different genres for letters. And so they'll try to say Romans is like a tractate or a diatribe or a philosophical letter of this sort. I don't find those discussions super helpful 
And the conservative scholars, uh, like here, Carson and Moo, uh, Schreiner says the same thing. They'll say, okay, we'll say it's not a highly personal letter, it's a tractate type letter, and beyond that, not very helpful. And I think that's good. Um, every letter from Paul is unique. Just like you know, anytime you sit down and write, you write something unique. You're following some genre norms, but how helpful is it really to go down that rabbit trail or that rabbit hole? Um, so I think that that works. Talk about date a little bit. This is, I think, more interesting and more helpful to me. Um, for the date of Romans, there's a pretty good consensus that we're between 55 and 59. And there are a couple of reasons for that. You have comments in Romans that he says he's headed to Jerusalem, chapter 15. And then the context of it is that he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's concerned about it. You can see in chapter 15, he's concerned that things are not going to go well. As you know from the history of Acts, they did not go well. And then he's planning to return back to Rome. And from Rome, he wants to continue on and go to Spain. Um, and if I'm putting that then into just a general context for the chronology of these books, I end up with something like this. Um, just a second. Let's see. Okay. Um, yeah, I end up with something roughly working like this for the chronology of Paul and his life events and then how that fits into everything. So here, early, early New Testament, Stephen Stone, Paul is converted, 33. I'm going to jump down here, second missionary journey, 49 to 51. Here is an, this is a relevant detail right here. Claudius expels the Jews from Rome in 49 come back to that in a little bit. Paul's third missionary journey ending in 57 and on his way back he's stopping in Greece we think maybe Corinth and it's possible that it's when he's at Corinth that he's writing the letter. In any case he's on his way back to Jerusalem. 54 is also relevant. Uh, Claudius dies. The Jews are allowed to go back to Rome. I'll just come back to that in a little bit. But you can notice that, 49, 54. He returns to Jerusalem, 57, and he's arrested, and then from there imprisoned and ends up actually going to Rome, ironically. Uh, he was planning to go freely, and he ends up going in chains. So it's somewhere around in here. Before Paul is arrested in Jerusalem, he's on his way there. And so end of the third missionary journey on his way to Jerusalem that he, he's writing this letter. Uh, just if you're looking for context, like how this would fit into the book of Acts, then the basic section of Acts would be end of 19, early part of 20. So here, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after, this, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Uh, he had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might ha have to not have to spend time in Asia. He was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So it's somewhere around this time. He's on his way to Jerusalem after that towards Rome that he's planning to, that he is writing uh, the book of Romans. Okay, I, you know, how does that help us uh, understand or appreciate? Well, part of what's going on here is that he is writing Romans, among other things, one of his purposes, is writing to them in the anticipation that he would come, that he would visit them in Rome, he would preach the gospel to them also in Rome, uh, chapter 15. But from there then, he wants to return back and to be helped by them <clears throat> in the cause of spreading the gospel all the way out into Spain. And here I'll show you Romans 15, 24. <clears throat> I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your comfort for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm bringing aid to the saints. Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution. They were pleased to do it. Um, when, therefore, I have completed this and have delivered it to them. So he's going to go to Jerusalem, deliver this offering. This is the offering, like the famous offering that comes up in 2 Corinthians, right? his goal to take this offering to Jerusalem, kind of a relief uh, or a help. When I have delivered what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. Um, and so if I just strip out the context here on these two verses for the word Spain, going to Spain, I will pass by and to be helped on my journey there by you. I will leave for Spain by way of you. 
part of the goal in Romans is he's he's inviting the church in Rome to be part of making it happen for him to go. He wants them to be part of this process. Um, and so he's inviting them to join in with it. And I think that's helpful. That helps us understand one of the purposes. It's not the only, it's not even maybe even the main purpose, but it's one of the purposes that Paul has for writing. I'll come back to that in a bit. Let me talk first about the recipients of the letter. Um, so I'll give you the answer and then I'll explain why or my reasoning behind it. The recipients, my understanding would be these are Jewish and Gentile Christians together, mixed in one church. Jewish and Gentile Christians in Rome. Um, we don't know exactly how the church in Rome got established. There's very good reason to believe that it was not uh, an apostles starting the church. It, it was not Peter or Paul um, and different reasons for that. So our best guess probably is something like after Pentecost, then people, Jewish people who heard the gospel returned back to Rome and they started a church. I think that's, the, that's probably, probably the most sensible and simple answer for how that happened. However, do you remember, I just showed this timeline a little bit ago. Uh, I think it was like 49 and 54. Um, 49, we have a couple of different details to support this. Apparently, there was enough rioting and mess and headache going on with Jewish uh, opposition to Christianity and other kinds of Jewish rioting. There's a lot of rioting happening, actually, in Jewish circles in the first century. That uh, the emperor kicks all of the Jews out of Rome. I say all. Um, we would assume not every single Jew, but a significant number of them. And you have reference to this actually in Acts. Um, so you remember Aquila and Priscilla are probably kicked out of Rome, expelled. Acts 18.2 just refers to this. They're probably kicked out of Rome, and that's part of Paul meeting them. They're Jewish. That's part of Paul meeting them in Ephesus. Okay, so that's 49. 54, then the emperor dies, and so Jews return back to Rome again. And it's very plausible that what you had going on in that case is a church that's started by possibly Jews, Pentecost, and then the Jews are kicked out. Five years later, you come back, and when you return, there's the church. It's like the church that you were part of. But while you were gone, <laughs> what do you think? The church became way more Gentile because you were gone. <laughs> um, so anyway, that, that might be like overreading the data, but anyway, I, I'm not, this is not my in, invention or something. I mean, this is part of the construction that's plausible. It's hard to demonstrate, but it's plausible that you'll pick up in some of the standard commentaries. So if that's the case in any, in any case, um, that could be a piece of it. In any case, however you wanted to configure that data, there is plentiful evidence in in Romans that Paul is addressing Jews. And I'll just show you some of the examples that I mean by that. So uh, just so you you uh, you follow my idea here, um, he's going to address both Jews and Gentiles. And I wanna show you that both are here, starting with Jews. If you call yourself a Jew, do you not know brothers? That, that is actually Jewish language. For I'm speaking to those who know the law. Uh, here, these Greek Priscilla, Priscilla and Aquila, which we know from Acts, they are Jews. Also, these names are Jewish, or we have reason to believe that they're Jews. My kinsman Herodian. Um, so we have enough information here that, I mean, at least some of the people he's greeting here demonstrably are Jewish. And then other passages in here that refer to people being Jewish or Jewish kind of concepts. We also have a decent biblical support in Romans at, or data to say that there are Gentiles in the group. Okay, so I'll just show you a couple of these, but the idea here is for the sake of his name among all the nations, this is ethne, so Gentiles definitely included, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, and that's a plural, and he's referring to them as part of the nations, which would not be the typical way to refer to someone who's Jewish. Um, I want to reap some harvest among, watch this, among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am speaking to you Gentiles. Um, here, uh, I don't remember the context here, or the argument here. 
but in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, this is that string of passages demonstrating the Gentile salvation concept. And, well, anyway, uh, it is my desire that Christ, what accomplished Christ, Christ accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. From Jerusalem to, Jer to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Um, all right, so I don't remember the exact link there, but anyway, extended passage there. Anyway, put that information together. We've got enough data to say that, yeah, there's Gentiles in this church as, as well. Okay, so as people try to construct their understanding of Romans, they could either downplay the Gentile passages and say, no, Paul's actually writing to Jews. Or you can downplay the Gentile, the Jew passages and say, no, he's actually writing to Gentiles. And depending on what your other exegetical, like your exegetical project is, <laughs> how you want to frame Romans, um, you can kind of bend the evidence either way. <laughs> uh, I think it's Carson who argues or just says that it's easier, if you wanted to make a case, the better case would be that Paul is writing to Gentiles. But the best case would be that Paul is writing to both. And that's, that's the way I want to understand Romans. And I think that best represents the information. Both are part of the church. There are Jews and Gentiles here. He's addressing both of them. There's no particular evidence that um, there's disunity in the church per se, but he is probing or exploring the Jewish Gentile question a lot in this book. And there are both Jews and Gentiles that are part of that conversation that are hearing this, that are working through the information. Well, so what then would be like the theological purpose or how do we, yeah, how do we understand his purpose, what he's intending to accomplish here? Um, and again, you can, you can put forward if you have a, like a narrow exegetical project, you want Romans to work a certain way or something, then there are a bunch of ways that you can focus in on a single purpose. Again, I think the richest explanation of the purpose of Romans is that there are multiple purposes. And let me show those to you as far as my understanding of what those purposes are. So specific multiple purposes, including first, um, specific pastoral needs. The most occasional section like, in other words, uh, specific or suited to them. The most occasional section of the book is chapter 14. And this is the, um, you know, whether you eat or you don't eat question. So weaker brother, stronger brother question. Um, okay, so there is some occasional content in the book. And I think it's intriguing and helpful here that Paul knew so many people in Rome, chapter 16. There's this long list of names. It shows that he knows something about this situation. I mean, he's familiar with the church. So it would be, I don't know, just like maybe a church at a distance. Maybe you've not ever even visited, but you've heard enough about it. You know, like half the congregation from having met them in other places. So even if you've never visited the church, you kind of feel like you know a little bit about it. Okay. And so, yeah, there's some of that. He is addressing specific issues. Probably more significantly, and this I think would be the core, he is generally theologizing to address the Jewish Gentile divide that's apparent in Acts, that's hinted at in Galatians, Colossians, Ephesians. Some of you guys mentioned Ephesians yesterday. It's a good point. Um, and to defend himself from the attacks of Judaizers who were claiming that Paul was against the law. Uh, pause here for a second with that. Something we miss because I'm a Gentile, so it doesn't really bother me. Um, something we miss is that there's a massive transition at work like conceptual transition, if you're watching Acts, or even back, go back to the Gospels in Luke, um, and the expectation that the Messiah comes for the Jews. Matthew does this in a really big way, that he, the Messiah is for the Jews, and then the Jews reject, and surprising Gentiles, except, no, of course there are. I mean, Nicodemus would be one that stands, Joseph of Arimathea. You've got these prominent Jews that do also accept. But in large part as a pattern, it's the Jews who primarily reject and it's the Gentiles who primarily accept. And that pattern extends now into Acts. So if you watch the narrative of Acts and just follow the, the flow of it, 
you know, the beginning Pentecost, 3,000 in Jerusalem, and then the numbers swell, and you get into chapter 3, and even some of the, some of the priests and religious leaders accepted. Um, so you have a very, like, Jewish core, and then you get out, and now Cornelius... And it keeps on going further and further out, and then it's it's it becomes like the church moves from being a Jewish thing to being a Gentile thing, and by the end of Acts, you've got Paul, Acts twenty eight saying, "I'm giving up because the every city I go to, the Jews are the problem. They keep on persecuting and destroying my efforts, and I'm going to the Gentiles. At least they will listen." I mean, it's very strong. So that that. That flow of thought in Acts, now you just lay that across the epistles, and this issue comes up a bunch in the epistles. But go further with that. Um, you are feeling the same dynamic when you read the Old Testament, and in certain passages you scratch your head and try to figure out how that applies to us. It's, it's, it's a very central dynamic to our Bibles, which is, it's the whole question that dispensationalism and a strong covenant theology are exploring. They're trying to, we're trying to figure out how do we orient or integrate the two Testaments. And, and so the flow across from Old Testament law and prophecies that point towards Christ versus Acts and the epistles that point outwards from Christ and how those fit together, that issue is massive. And I think we give lots of credit to Hebrews for being the epistle that addresses that. Hebrews is being the place where I get my answer to the Jewish Gentile question. But Romans is the other big one. <laughs> and, and we, we just, I, I, I have not appreciated enough how thickly and richly it's integrated into all of Romans. So if I, if I recognize then some of the background that we're talking about, Jewish and Gentile within the church, and then I'm, I'm recognizing that Paul is theologizing to them, he's helping explain how I should think about transition from Old Testament to New Testament, how those go together. He's exploring some of that. And how are God's laws, or excuse me, God's promises to the Jewish nation still going to be fulfilled? Another piece of that, and this is where it feels more like Galatians, um, he's, he's defending himself from the attacks of Judaizers who claim that Paul was against the law. And this is my point, the point I was uh, kind of hammering on earlier. Paul demonstrates that his gospel and his teaching about the law and about Israel fulfills the Old Testament promises. So, I mean, here's another place where it's parallel to the Galatians concept. I'm not coming up with my own gospel here, but he's going to argue and then he's just going to hammer it and then he's going to hammer it. He's going to do it constantly all over the place. He'll keep on doing intertextuality as a way of building his apologetic, actually, that his gospel does fulfill the Old Testament expectations. Um here I found my list of passages that I was looking for here. The gospel that God promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. The one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Here are the commandments. Um, and then the end of the book, it has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations. Anyway, I mean, it's, a, it's all over the place that his argument is everything I'm saying is compatible with the Old Testament and just a, a continuation on it, an extension of it. Okay, uh, there were, there's another purpose and a half uh, that we can talk about. Okay, so the purposes that I already said were specific pastoral needs in Rome and then general theolo theologizing on the Jewish-Gentile divide. Here's a big one, though, and it's preparing the church to join in Paul's missionary endeavors in Spain. I'm not going to look at the references for this one because we already did in Romans 15, and then it's, I think it's mentioned again in, in chapter 1. But yeah, that's part of his idea. He does plan to go out, go beyond to um, Spain. Is it like Paul fundraising? I mean, he needs help. But I, I think basically the idea is he wants them to join in the cause for the gospel. It's not really just fundraising as though I need money and you guys are the way I'm going to get it. But it's I want you guys to be part of it. <laughs> Let's make this a partnership. Let's. I want you to share in the blessing. When I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to preach the gospel. I'll do it with money or without it. But I want you to be part. <laughs> I think that's the way I would understand it. But he wants to prepare them that they would be interested in doing this. I said um, a purpose and a half. So here, 
Schreiner adds one, it's not really a purpose, but I just liked it and I grabbed it. Schreiner argues that Paul intends to extol the gospel so that the Roman believers will rejoice to be part of its spread in Spain. Basically what I said earlier. But here, directly from Schreiner, Paul ultimately wrote Romans as a servant of God to honor his Lord. <laughs> and I mean, I don't want to lose sight of that, right? I mean, we focus on what's the purpose of this, this, this. But I mean, fundamentally, he's he's loving the gospel <laughs> and he's proclaiming the gospel. And uh, I just thought that was that was great <laughs> to keep keep ourselves centered in that. I won't take time with this one, um, the integrity of Romans. When we say integrity, we don't mean, I hear integrity, I think lying or you know telling the truth or lying. Um, by integrity, what we mean by that is the, the book is one book as opposed to like several books that were kind of put together or something. And uh, the only, generally Romans, for their, I'll say this, Nobody has articulated a thesis of Romans was originally three books and then somebody stuck it together. Nobody has argued a thesis like that that has really stuck. <laughs> so the integrity of the book itself mostly has held. Um, I will say there is an issue, and Brent, I think we'll talk about this next time. The basic issue is 1625 to 27. It's like a doxology at the end. And that has appeared textually in the textual history that's appeared in five different configurations so it's appeared at the end of 16 it's appeared at like i think at part way through 15 it's appeared at the end of 14 in other words we've got different texts and different configurations of it and so for some people they'll say well actually there's a decent case that there were some of the church fathers who had a 14 chapter version of romans i don't mean just that it was divided that way but they didn't have 15 and 16. um I want to say Tertullian, but don't quote me. Anyway, one of the fathers speaks, it sounds like he thinks the end of the book is at the end of chapter 14. I don't think that necessarily cripples us. Um, you know, if you're talking about a day when everything has to be handwritten, he, the last two pages got ripped off. I mean, <laughs> anyway, they got lost. Um, you know, I, <laughs> okay. The fact that he had a shorter version doesn't mean that the original was shorter. And the actual best thesis that explains the data is, you remember Marcion? Marcion uh, didn't like the Old Testament, and so he tried to cut up, I mean, he actually did. He cut up parts of the New Testament and actually rejected the Old Testament, made it evil and stuff like that. Well, he apparently didn't like chapter 15 on because you've got a lot of data in there that's connected, link linking into the Old Testament. I would argue that it's through the entire book. But anyway, um, there's at least, I think it's Origen who says that Marcion chopped off the last two chapters in his edition. So there's a decent argument that that edition got around to some people, and, and that's what we're looking at. Um, in any case, the way I'm talking about it sounds like there's a lot of uncertainty. There's not. The data, the textual data, though there are these other configurations, the textual data is pretty strong that, okay, we, we had a 16-chapter book. It's just one or two of the church fathers had a shorter version of it for whatever reason that's what they got but there there's a very good argument to be made that this is what we've got 16 chapters and and there's good support for that all right i want to move to the next topic which is to talk about the thematic or theological center of romans how to read it and how to how to orient ourselves or how we're gonna how we're gonna frame our understanding theologically um so I'll talk about structure in a bit. You've got like four major sections and it's kind of interesting, depending on a person's exegetical project, how they want to frame Romans, they will read the book through one of those sections. Okay, so here I'll show you the, the chart and then I think this will make sense. Um, but to some extent, rightly or wrongly, this is a criticism that gets thrown at the reformers. People will argue that the reformers are primarily reading all of Romans through the lens of chapters one to four. I don't think that's fair. I think particularly like Calvin is reading Romans just really well, <laughs> um, but whatever. So people will argue that they read Romans one to four as the center and therefore justification by faith is the core of Romans. Um, another option is to read chapters 5 to 8 as the center. Union with Christ, the Spirit, is the center. That's the core. And so you read everything else through that lens. Chapters 9 to 11, 
salvation history for Jews and Gentiles. So that you understand what I mean by that, you see Dunn, uh, who's a foremost or leading pers uh, representative, or was anyway, of the new perspective on Paul. The framework for this would go, all of Romans is there just to argue Paul's case that Jews and Gentiles ought to be united and stop fighting with each other. And so we read all of the rest of Romans through the lens of 9 to 11. Or you can go here, and if you if you put a lot of emphasis on what I observed earlier, Jewish Gentile groups within the church, and so how do they interact? If you put all your emphasis there, then you make it all about 14 and 15, and you read the whole book through that lens. Um, I don't want to do any of these exactly. Uh, you know, the, the tradition of the reformers reading, they get they get beat up a lot for their reading of Romans. Um, like I said, particularly Calvin is just reading it really well, I, I think. But in any case, I want to read the whole book and not try to stuff the entire book through one section. Okay, the whole thing stands together. And if we were looking then to try to pull it together, uh, here, I'll, I'll actually put this up. You can read along with me. But Carson and Moom will just say that uh, Romans is Paul's statement of the gospel. Anyway, I, I like that. That's good. <laughs> Romans is Paul's statement of the gospel. That includes issues of salvation history. Since, and I'm quoting now, the way in which the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between law and gospel, Israel and the church, is expressed, the degree of continuity, continuity and discontinuity is fundamental to the construction of any Christian theology. I mean, if you're going to read theology in a Christian way, you've got to answer the question of the Testaments. But Romans supplies the basic building blocks for the construction of that foundation. So basically, what is the gospel? And they'll continue on Paul's argument, even though we have the Jewish Gentile question, Paul's argument is still deeply concerned with salvation for any individual. I don't want to go here uh, because it's a really hairy, messy question, um, and it gets into new perspective on Paul's stuff. But just passing, the new perspective on Paul wants to say, no, it's not about how do I get saved. It's, it's corporate. It's group. It just doesn't fit. <laughs> Romans 1 to 8, there's... It doesn't fit the reading of Romans 1 to 8. I don't think it fits a human reality. I want to know that I'm going to be with God, that I'm going to have my sins forgiven. And I mean, I care about the people around me, but each one of us has to know me and God. <laughs> what is my standing before him? So sure, there's a corporate element that in individualistic Western contexts we miss, but there's also a reality of every individual standing before Almighty God. That's just reality too. So that's what I'm arguing here. And and I think that I love this. This is just really, it's helpful. This is Paul's statement of the gospel. Here's Calvin. Uh, Romans is about, or the theme of Romans, man's only righteousness is the mercy of God in Christ when it is offered by the gospel and received by faith. So way to go, Calvin. It's great. Um, Calvin foresaw, foresaw all of the new perspective on Paul stuff and anticipated it all and covered it all in just one sentence. So that's Calvin for you. Um, one or two other comments before I go to structure. This is a bit of an excursus, but I, I talked about the background. And um, Romans is a central battleground, really, for background or the assumed background shaping the way that we think about our interpretation. So I want to comment about that. In other words, what I mean by this is if you assume Romans is written to, to, to um, Gentiles, you can frame the book one way. And if it's, okay, no, it's only written to Jews, you can frame it another way. More significantly, and this is the new perspective thing again, if you assume some things or you argue some things about Judaism in Paul's day worked this way or Judaism in Paul's day worked that way, you can reconfigure the whole book, and they do. <laughs> so your background, your assumed background, as in, okay, this is what I think was happening, can end up reshaping your entire reading. And I would just like to interact with that. Dr. Collins has taken us here before uh, and extended our argument for this. But I, I just want to comment on it for a bit. Uh, several critical questions hang on our assumptions about the backdrop of Romans. Should background studies shift our entire reading? 
I would argue if our reading hangs significantly on those background questions, if we cannot clearly answer those background questions from the text, it's like, you know, my assumed background changes everything. Also, we have no way of knowing. <laughs> have we not lost the sufficiency and clarity of the text? The text at that point, meaning is lost if that much hangs on the background. My presuppositional approach to interpretation sets me to limit how much I'm willing to reshape my reading based on background. And my assumption or my argument would go if the provenance, like where it came from, and situation of the letter cannot be clearly demonstrated, yea, verily, from the letter itself, I would affirm that some of those background questions are not that critical to my understanding of the text because I come from a presupposition that the text and the meaning of the text will stand. It's not all going to collapse just because we haven't dug down to the next strata yet. You know, if you could just turn over a few more rocks and find a few more papyri, then we could find out what Romans really means. Um, I presuppositionally reject that. And so I, I, my, my presupposition here is that God has given us enough data in the text to understand it. And, and yeah, we get supporting data and it helps. I can still value background studies and I, sure. Um, I, even the recent work on Judaism by Sanders, in some cases it can help me nuance my understanding. In fact, without having done this work, without, uh, inadvertently, I think, the traditional readings may have made the opposite mistake what I mean is we may have assumed a caricatured background for the text. If, if you hear all Jews believed in works righteousness, you know, I mean, we kind of say that, okay, Jews and Judaism and Pharisees. And so it was all works righteousness. You know, did we, okay, honest, did we go back and read and understand Second Temple Judaism to understand what they did believe? Or are we just kind of like assuming? So we kind of made them same mistake. And as a result, then, maybe we read the text through the lens of Jewish works righteousness without doing the work of carefully understanding what was happening. At the same time, um, and I'm interacting here now with new perspective. If this argument makes sense to you, great. If not, it, you could, this would be a good time. You could uh, sit back and rest a little bit. But is summarizing the beliefs of Second Temple Judaism really plausible? to the level of detail that New Perspective argues. Um, my feeling on this, would I appreciate someone summarizing the beliefs of 21st century Christianity at this level of detail and then reading all of my writing against that background? Can you really summarize 21st century Christianity? Christians in 2021 believed, what do you put in the blank? <laughs> Christians, what do you... That's like everything. I mean, it, it, there's all kinds of things that people called Christians say. So, I mean, just to summarize, Christianity in 2021 believed X, Y, Z, three bullet points. No, <laughs> it's way more complicated than that. Okay, well, that's how Judaism was. So you can't just say Judaism works righteousness or Judaism covenantal gnomism. It's not that simple. And even in Acts, it's apparent that the Jewish authorities, sometimes even the apostles, are still working out their understanding of Christianity and salvation history. What if Paul is addressing a specific group of people? Uh, when we read about the opponents of Jesus in the Gospels or in the Apostles, that actually better fits the traditional reading that we're assuming as background for Romans than the new perspective. Okay, so anyway, uh, sorry, that's a little bit of a rabbit trail, um, but I'll leave that there. Uh, that argumentation you can look back over if you're interested at another time or if you're having trouble going to sleep some night or something. <laughs> it can help you drift off easier. Um, I'm going to here end out with the, uh, the structure of Romans, and I'll show you a couple of outlines. By the way, I didn't mention this till now, but uh, I, all these notes I'll give to you as a PDF, um, and I'll drop that in the chat right after this. So anyway, you can read through or... <laughs> you can print it up and wad it up and throw it in the trash can or burn it or whatever you want. But I'll send you the PDF for it if you want access to it. I took a couple of outlines. Here's Cranfield. Uh, so this is that that more academic uh, international critical, critical commentary two volume, the really expensive one. <laughs> um, unless you get it on Logos and then it's not so bad. 
Uh, but here's his layout. Okay, so you have a prologue. Pretty much everyone recognizes that. And then kind of an extended prologue. So almost it's like 1, 1 to 16 is introduction content. The 1, 1 to 7 is prologue all the way. Um, the theme of the epistle, 1, 16 and 17. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God. And then 118 through 425, uh, the righteousness which is from by faith alone. 5 through 8, then 9 through 11, 12 to 15, and 15 to 16. Okay, I won't read his breakdown because I think this is just the relevant part of it. Basically, that like division of things, some variation, but that's basically what everybody does. So I'm going to show you ESV Study Bible. I thought I actually like this outline the best. Maybe it's just really simple. It's easy to grab. Uh, I just pulled out the main points so you can see it. But anyway, there's kind of like the prologue and theme. 118 to 320, God's wrath against sinners. 3 and 4, the saving righteousness of God. So anyway, Cr Cranfield had these two together. Uh, ESV, Study Bible, splitting it. But yeah, whatever. Hope is a result of righteousness. So 5 to 8 hangs together. Pretty much everybody knows that. 9 to 11, 9 to 11 hangs together and some kind of Israel and the Gentiles discussion. 12 to 15, practical living. It's like the practical turn of the book. And then the end of it is probably focused on the Spain mission, uh, you know, his visions, his, his missional visions with a conclusion. Uh, one more here. I, this, by the way, this is the full outline. I just gave the whole thing with all the sub points, but it's too much to put up on the screen. Uh, here's Schreiner, basically the same thing. 1 to 17, 118 to 320. Uh, 321 to 425. So here, all of us are sinners. All of us have life or righteousness by God's grace. Uh, the hope that results from that, 5 to 8, God's righteousness to Israel and the Gentiles, 9 to 11, practical Pauline mission. There you go. Anyway, I, I just wanted to show you three different outlines to show you actually the way that we divide up Romans is not terribly under in dispute. Um, pretty much the commentators are going the same direction and just it's kind of how you how you do the labels um, how you want to how you want to label or summarize each one but pretty much we're looking at the same blocks the same blocks of text okay um, yeah I don't remember how the in the t in the chat here just a comment uh, Nacelli summarizes Romans God's righteous way of righteousing or justifying the unrighteous I don't remember, but I want to say that's just like tweaked a little bit from um, the way Minnick gave his outline or gave his theme when he preached through this. In any case, that's just, uh, there's nothing new here. I'm not saying Nicelli got it from Minnick per se. I think that's, yeah, that's, he's taking that from what is that like 329, 320? Yeah, I think it's like 329, 26 to 29, that section, uh, that God may be just and justify the ungodly. So, yeah, and that's definitely a context or uh, a critical statement. How much, you know, do you integrate the other pieces or how much do you focus in on that uh, kind of reformation focus, the first part of the book? But yeah, it's good. Well, I didn't expect to have the seven minutes left here, but I am very glad to. I'm going to I have some data here that I was going to save for a future lecture, but I'll do it now. And that will just give me a little bit more time in the future. Um, so let me talk about overview of one and two. We'll go for seven minutes and I'll just finish right on time. Um, but I wanna show you a couple of highlights so that you are thinking ahead. So Brent's gonna give us like the, the overview for um, textual criticism. And then after that, we go to Michael Riley and Dr. Um, Olinger talking us through issues in chapter one. So in a future lecture, I'll do more here, but I do wanna go ahead and talk about some of this now so that you just will just recognize some of the patterns that are going on in chapter one. Uh, starting with here at the very front end, again, I'm, I'm gonna save this. This will be way out. Andrew Minnick will hit this. Uh, he'll talk about this this some in more depth but just being conscious chapters one or chapter one verses one to six this is just thick thick theology and you're going to notice in this section basically you're going to see like a definition of the gospel 
So uh, here, the gospel of God set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand. You're going to see then explanation of how that works out concerning his son. You're going to see Davidic connections. He was prophesied or as a son of David. You're going to see resurrection. Um, and then that's going to take you out to missions, missiology <laughs> among all the nations, which maybe takes me into the next thing I'd be glad to emphasize on that respect. In this first chapter, you're going to get a lot of, I'll just call it universalizing language or a universal focus that anticipates the all every salvation is for every person. Okay, so let me show you what I mean by that universalizing kind of concept. Uh, here, Romans 1, 5, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of his faith, uh, of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Uh, to those who are loved by God, all those in Rome who are called to be saints, um, I thank my God that your faith is proclaimed in all the world, both to Greeks and to barbarians, to wise, to foolish. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the salvation for Jews first and also to the Greek. So universalizing, which is to say, basically the subtext. Salvation is not just for Jews. Salvation is not just for Gentiles. Salvation is for humans. And it's for the world, that kind of concept. Also worth recognizing the pattern that stretches across both chapters, this salvation both for Jew and Gentile language. So here, similar kind of construction here in 116, to the Jew first, also to the Greek, tribulation, distress, for the Jew first and also the Greek, glory and honor, everyone who does good, good the Jew first, also the Greek. Um, again, just a repeated pattern that he keeps on doing in both of these two chapters. And that sets me up to say this, my reading of chapters one and two, my understanding of the first part of Romans, is that Paul's argument, you've heard this, very traditional. Paul's understanding of, or Paul's foundation is salvation is for Jew and Greek because both Greek or Gentiles, what he's talking about, both Gentiles, chapter one, and Jews, chapter two, stand condemned under God's righteous law. Gentiles, because they have that law in their hearts. Jews, because even though they have the law, they don't listen to it. All of us, in trouble. <laughs> all of us stand condemned. And that universalizing all every, all of us are in trouble kind of concept then becomes the foundation. Actually, if you keep on going out there, it's going to point all the way to chapter three, the verse that we, we quote a lot, Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Um, but all have sinned keeps on going all can be justified because all are guilty. <laughs> so actually, the, the universality of the curse or the universality of the sin, Gentiles are condemned because they're doing all kinds of manner of wickedness. Jews are condemned because they have the righteousness of the law, but they don't do it. All of us are guilty. There is none righteous, chapter 3, 10 to, what is it, like 18, that that diatribe of Old Testament quotations. There's none righteous. No, not, well, anyway, we should look at it. There's none righteous. No, not one. All have turned aside. I mean, it's another universalizing passage, right? It's just all, every, all, every here. There is no one who does good, not even one. Anyway, very, very strong. Nobody is righteous. Okay, and I go just after that here. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And because of that, the righteousness of God is for all. <laughs> and it's beautiful. <laughs> so it's chapter one, you're a Gentile, you're in trouble. Chapter two, you're a Jew, you're in trouble. Chapter three, all of us are in trouble. End of chapter three, all of us are in trouble. And in that and in spite of that, the grace and goodness and righteousness of God is for all. <laughs> because we're all a mess. The righteousness of God is for all, without exception. Absolutely beautiful. Um, and I'll just end with that encouragement. I mean, this is the story of, this is the story of the Bible. God takes messy things and creates beautiful things out of them. This is you know, like think Joseph, uh, think Abraham, think David. I don't care. Pick your character. <laughs> pick your book. Pick your narrative. And even here in Romans. Uh, 
we're a mess. We're just a mess. <laughs> and God takes messy, awful things and he creates beautiful things out of them. And so somehow in the mess, um, just the, the sewage that is our sin and our failure, the righteousness of God is revealed. <laughs> And his justification power is revealed. And you don't really appreciate the beauty of chapter 3. All of us can be declared righteous until you appreciate the, the darkness of chapter 1 and 2. Jew, Gentile, all of us are in a bad place. We're a mess. <laughs> but it's, it's the mess of who we are that then turns, by God's grace and his power, into the beauty of what he accomplishes through the gospel. Well... Uh, next time, we'll look forward to picking up here. That's on Thursday uh, with Brent Nidergall. Uh, there's that article. Please take a look at it. You'll, you'll be able to follow the lecture along. You'll, you'll appreciate it and, and I think benefit more if you can read that article. And let me drop in the chat before I go here. Here's the link to our lecture notes from today and actually the notes that will it'll kind of um, move into our next lecture in a couple of weeks. So, okay, that's it. Better end on one minute overtime. <laughs> um, thanks to all. We'll uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in uh, a couple of days on Thursday. So have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.